We found out in a recent publication, this is in the, this year, in the, in the 2011 paper from John of Clinica Perio, if we compare two different systems from the same company, and I don't like to speak in favor or against companies, but because we use the systems today, and we don't know actually well the literature, and very often studies, they are very new, a recent publication here, they showed, for example, that if you have a scalloped implant or the traditional internal connection here, we lose always bone. Hello? We lose bone. We lose bone. The connections are almost similar. We have here scalloped implant and here, and here the conventional implant design in the area of the crest. So we know that we lose more in bone. So now we go to other systems with platform switching or platform shifting, it depends on the implant system, which have rigid implant abutment connection from the biomechanical standpoint, shift and minimization of the gap, horizontal biological width, which allows a bone growth onto the implant shoulder. If, of course, the implant design has a rough surface on the top of the shoulder. <clears throat> And we have seen the previous studies in monkeys. I had to work for a couple of years in Malaysia to work with monkeys who cannot actually brush the teeth. And we cannot brush the teeth and the implants of the monkeys because we have to do all of these things under general anesthesia. And then we overdose the monkeys and we kill the monkeys within a period of time of six to nine months. That's why I appreciate, of course, the extremely interesting studies by the group from Gothenburg but you can use always toothbrushes and toothpastes for the uh, uh, dogs and to reduce significantly the plaque accumulation, but in the monkeys you have always some kind of mucositis. So now, in the conventional design of implants, we know we have always bone loss. And if we decide now to change this kind of type of abutment implant connection to mesialize and to have a platform shifting, people say then that we can have a better um, stabilization of the crest of the bone. Let's look if it is really true that, and in the last uh, actually three years at the University of Rochester, I work with my team uh, extremely s s solid in this field and probably and hopefully in the next year uh, from our conferences, I can give you the statistical changes of the crest of bone over different systems. But you see here we have these two implants with uh, different uh, here diameters, and we change the abutment diameter in a wider abutment and a narrower diameter abutment. You see here we lose the bone, and here we have more bone. Interesting. And this was a coincidence with the very old system Friali 2. Nobody uses today, as I know. So, but if we look now in other systems, recent systems here, we measure and we talk very easily about this kind of platform shifting, but there are no studies showing long-term stability over this kind of implant designs. So, the classical design in the crest of bone disappears, we talk about two millimeter bone loss, and for some people this is normal. For me, as a periodontist, this is abnormal, it's not normal, because if I amputate the leg of a patient and stays with one leg, of course survives this patient. But two legs is the ideal condition for a human being. And crest of bone over a period of time on an implant is very important. So if you mesialize, if you have a platform shifting, we have a trouble here with this kind of systems that the crest of the implant is very wide in the most cases. And then, of course, we have stabilization of the bone if you have sufficient width of the bone. But if a patient has four millimeter, five millimeter width of the bone, you have difficulties to place such implants. Other companies here, they say, or the Strauman company, it's better to avoid to have a micro gap, like the classical TPS implant from uh, the Lederman uh, philosophy, the Lederman school years ago, or here the ankylos and the three eye. And in the Astra system, you see also this kind of mentality or concept, but after 10 years, for me, as a periodontist, I see some kind of bone loss. 
It depends how you do the second stage surgery. It depends where you place the implant. And I know very well, Linton showed very nice results of a period of time, but you can get good and bad results today with every implant system. If you look now, how, off, how old is the platform shifting? This is actually a four-year radiographical evaluation in a dog in vivo from the Bronomark studies. If you see here, the bone is over this platform switching because accidentally at that time, coincidence was not the place narrow diameter abutments. And if you compare now 2001 and 10 years later, the implants here in humans, they have more bone if you have a platform shifting. So this is possible today. It depends, of course, where you place your implants, or in this case, after 10 years. So now comparing these implants at the same patient, you see we have bone loss, we have bone loss, and here we don't have bone loss. It depends how you deal with the implant design, where you place your implant, how was the width of the, of the bone of the alveolar ridge, if you have augmentations or not, and maybe if you load the implants at the same time or not. And this is our topic. But all the implants, they are stable, that's why we can talk about high implant survival rate, but not about success. <clears throat> so now, I mentioned to you before, in a comparative study, two systems have been placed at the same day at the same mouth of the patients. And you see, after one year, and now we make the statistical evaluation of 19 patients after two years, we see that the platform switching is not so important. It's important how is the highest part of the diameter of the implant, the collar of the implant, and how you place the implant in, in comparison with the alveolar ridge or the crest of the bone. And in addition to that, if you load these implants immediately or delayed, this is immediate loading. I don't know, I have problems with the, the monitor here. And in another here case, you see single implants which are placed very close together, or here, five years follow up, if these implants, they are almost in touch, if we, we want to, to, to compare if it is correct, what my mentor, Danny Starno, in the past used to say, if the distance between the implants is less than three millimeters, if this bone disappears or not. You see here, the bone is here. We don't have any problems with the bone loss. <clears throat> And we have seen that over a period of time in animals, and we have seen that also in humans, that you can uh, have very close together implants to stabilize the crest of the bone over the platform. And if these implants have also rough surface, I expect to have also also integration. Now, systematically, we start with different examples. This is a delayed loading case where we have done many years ago, the teeth have been extracted in the maxilla, we did documentation with posterior remus from the posterior mandible. Four months later, I opened the flap and we have very nice bone, as you see. And we decided here to place only six implants in the correct distribution, exactly in the same way like Lyndon uh, said in his presentation. And in the lower jaw, I didn't place more than two and two implants for three unit bridges. The implants have been loaded after four months of the healing. The osseointegration integration was completed. I placed the abutments and I didn't take any impression from the implant level, but from the abutment level. So at the day of the delivery of the restorations, we have these results at the left and the right side, respectively, and the patient is very happy, and seven years later, we have a very nice aesthetic result. The restoration was uh, here cemented restoration, could be also, of course, screw retained restoration. In this particular case, this is a patient who has three problems. The first problem is that it's a young patient, it's a girl, it's a lady. This is for me always a problem. The second problem is that the patient had a very high smile line. And the third problem was that the patient is very pretty. So in many cases with that condition, it's better to refer to somebody else. So we decided in this particular case uh, to open a flap, minimal invasive surgery, and then we extend the alveolar ridge with osteotomes and because this patient um, we place the implant, because this patient has high smile line, and we have the concavity in the buccal aspect of the alveolar ridge, and because the patient is young, these thoughts are very important in my brain when I make my treatment plan. 
I assume this patient has also some wisdom tooth. We remove the wisdom tooth and we have some uh, cancellous bone. And on the top, we made the augmentation and we covered the augmentation site with a bioguide membrane. We close the flap and you see now, after two years, the final result without any ceramic abutment, without any ceramic restoration, with a normal conventional metal ceramic restoration in a very normal um, dental lab without a very high qualified dental technician. And this is the result after four years. And I believe you can see also from the back of the room the result looks very nice, could be also better if we have a full ceramic restoration. <clears throat> Or in this case, the patient is a very complicated patient because he is a medical doctor. He knows much better than all of us about the biology of the bone. So he decided to come to us because he lost all of his teeth after a traffic accident years ago, and we placed implants. And in this particular case, we decided to use ceramic abutments, and this is after one year, the aesthetic result of this patient. And the patient is able, of course, to brush to clean these areas very nicely. In that particular case, very young patient who does not like to have any advanced surgical procedures. You realize that there is a here discrepancy between the left and the right side in the height. The best thing would be to do a vertical augmentation in this area and maybe some lateral augmentation, but the patient di didn't like to have any big surgeries and we decide to place the implants. Here I need always not only the good implant system, not my surgical skills or prosthetic skills, but I need a very good dental technician. And I believe in the ICOI we must focus also in the future on this area because the technicians, they have today a lot of knowledge and sometimes much more knowledge that we dentists have. So we need, in this case, to do... Uh, some aesthetic kind of restoration with some kind of recession. That's why Oliver Briggs, the dental technician, did this excellent job. At the left side, we had this result. And this is the smile line of this young lady after four months. And also after one year, she came back and she had a good pearl, but not in the area where I did the restoration, but the ingestion tooth. And she is very happy. <clears throat> After two years, very nice result. How about now the present condition of our loading? What do we know today? Because we grow in dentistry, in implant dentistry, and we cannot stay, be, uh, you cannot be always in the same concept like P.I. Bronomark used to say. If we look in the literature, in the delayed loading cases here, delayed loading, after eight years follow-up, in a number of over 7,000 implants, we have a success rate, actually survival rate of 92%. How about now, if we look at the literature with the immediate loading implants? And my lecture is a little bit different than, a little bit different than from Jeff and from Lyndon. In terms of maxilla and mandible, we can have a very high survival rate. Almost 95% is the survival rate, independent on the implant systems we use. And if we look now in the histological evaluation, we will see that there are data in humans, in monkeys, in mini pigs, and the BIC in percentage is here almost 67%, which shows, in other words, that the implants, they become also integrated. Remodeling, according to BI Bronomark, takes place when you start loading the implants. I say that again. If I ask anybody in the room, what does it mean bone remodeling? Everybody says it's the dynamic process where we get new bone formation and in the same time bone resorption and at the less we have some kind of balance. This is not true. This is true under the functional loading conditions. And you see here, if you don't have the occlusal contacts or here the provisionalization or final restoration, the bone is not remodeled we have a kind of disused atrophy. The bone becomes osteoporotic. So how much we can push the envelope in our implant dentistry today with the middle loading concepts? For some of you folks, maybe you have seen these histological evaluations. I don't want to show you again and again and again the same pictures. But the middle load implants in the posterior part of the mandible, which is very poor bone quality bone, 
compared to the delayed loading implants in the contralateral site at the same monkey, shows that we do not have differences in terms of BICs, but the bone around the adjacent periodontally healthy teeth and the bone around the implants looks similar and far away where you do not have occlusal loading forces, the bone does not respond in the same way. If we analyze this histomorphometrically, you see exactly 60 to 65 percent are the bone to implant contacts in percentage. If we do, do use immediate or delayed loading, no statistically significant difference between the two groups. But if you go ahead and you measure the mineralized bone area around the implant at the interface within one millimeter in the zone of the uh, bone uh, in contact with the implant surface, you see significantly that we have much more bone, mineralized bone, when these implants are immediately loaded. This is what we know histologically and histomorphometrically from the monkey studies. Now we jump to the dogs. How about the studies from Gothenburg? A very interesting experiment has been done by the group from Abraham and the cork workers who showed, for example, that if you place your healing abutments and you remove the healing abutments over implants for a short period of time, three, four, five times, this is the test group, the epithelium will migrate very deeply and pre has not any protection, the connective tissue, because here we don't get connective tissue attachment and we have epithelial attachment. That means there is always a risk to have a kind of pocket. And the final result is that we lose the bone. So I'm positive we have to consider this issue in dentistry from the periodontal standpoint. Now I don't speak as a prosthodontist. I don't speak as a pro oral surgeon. I speak as a periodontist. And the problem is, from the prosthodontic standpoint, we like to remove the abutments or the healing caps to make impressions from the implant level. Have you measured that, what happens to this bone? You should do that in some of your cases, and you will remember my words, you lose the bone. 